God, we, we thank you that we can come together and learn about these important truths. Lord, we pray that you would be our teacher and you would guide and instruct us in uh, the things concerning you. Lord, we thank you for your word and the fact that it is true and that it is clear. And, and we also um, praise you for the, the depths that it contains. Uh, we, we can say with... Um, with, as saints have said throughout history, that we, we see the depths, but we don't see the bottom. And Lord, as we wrestle with some deep truths, indeed this mystery is great, as, as Paul says, Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom. We pray that you would guard us against, um, guard us from having wrong interpretations of these things, guard us from errors, and, and we pray that the application of all that we uh, see in your word would be one of seeing and savoring Christ more and then through our union with him producing fruit that is pleasing to him. And we also pray that, that as we see these things too, it would, it would fill us with hope and encouragement in the present, but it would also orient us to the future that we would long, that we would say, come Lord Jesus, that we would see that the the true realization of all these things that we talk about is something that we only know now in part, and yet one day we will know in full. But Lord, fill us with faith that we may walk now by, by faith, longing for the day when we will walk by sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 12 and of all the passages that I looked at, this was the one that was the most difficult for me to, to wrestle with. So you're not allowed to ask questions about this one. No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, but this is, this is the one that uh, I, I, I think we need to think more about. And if, if all this does is just provokes you to think more about these things, then that is, um, that is good. So uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 12. And as you're, you're getting there, I want to tell you a story about a man named Joe. Just made him up. I'm not thinking of any one particular person, but I am thinking about a lot of people that I've known throughout the years in, in various churches whose stories were similar. Joe is a believer. He trusted Christ many years ago. He's married in his mid-30s. He and his wife are are members of a healthy church. He comes every Sunday and, and you know, everything looks good. Uh, he sings passionately. He listens to the sermons. He relates to other men. Joe and his wife look like they have a fairly healthy marriage. The church just recently asked Joe to be a deacon. And ever since high school, Joe has been viewing pornography regularly. As a Christian, he knows that it's wrong. He feels convicted. He hates it. He's made several attempts to stop. He's gone weeks, and even one time two months, without looking at anything. But each time of success ends with a crash. And he'll go back to it all over again. And it actually gets worse each time. Joe's wife knows that there's something deeply wrong with Joe and with their marriage. There's a restlessness about him. He, he can't be still with her. But just thinking about what it could be uh, makes her feel so shameful and have anxiety that she just pretends it away. Joe's very troubled about his sin. He, his last crash has sent him in a darker place than ever before. He's become increasingly dissatisfied with just looking at pictures, and he wants to pay for a prostitute. That attracts him in a way that he can't understand. He fantasizes about it. He's figured out when and where and how. And he's scared because the desire for this sin is so strong. Joe is made up, but there are many Joes out there. They are in your church. They are sitting in the chairs. They're serving in the ministry. And by the way, they could be men and women. The notion that sexual temptation is just for men is wrong. 
The question uh, that I want to pose uh, for you as we think about this section in, uh, in Paul's letter as we see another marriage metaphor, the question I want to propose for you is, how is your preaching meaningful to somebody like Joe? I don't just mean, well, do you talk about the dangers of, of sexual sin and pornography in your sermons? Because uh, even though I think we should mention it, there's good reason to be discreet. I mean, does the way that you talk about sin and temptation and holiness and, and the power of the gospel and the impotence of the law, uh, is the way that you talk about those things something that resonates with someone like Joe? Or would he feel that his struggle is just of a category all of its own. It's not like everybody else's sin. It's something totally different that really can't be targeted with the same things that other people will use for fighting their sin. Or to put it another way, would your preaching direct someone like Joe to gospel-driven obedience or would you talk about the gospel in one hand, but when you actually sit down and relate to Joe, if he came with you, to you with his struggles, you, 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 would, you would just give him law. You would just say, okay, do this, do this, do this. Or do you say that the gospel has power for fighting sexual sin, but you're so vague and ambiguous about how that actually works that at the end of the day, Joe's just confused and doesn't really know what to do. Well, this is the third of the marriage metaphor passages in Paul, and I ordered them this way because I think this passage does a good job building on the previous one and illustrating for us something of how we can confront sin in, in such a way that is not, as Romans 7 says, the oldness of the written code but the newness of the spirit. I think this gives us a case study in fighting sin. Now, before I read this passage, I, I'd be helpful to point out a matter of interpretation. Um, that is, not everything that you read in this passage, Paul agrees with here. Because what, what's going on in this passage, it's kind of confusing, but Paul is quoting the words of the Corinthians, quoting like slogans that they would say, and then refuting him, refuting those slogans. So you can't take this as this is what Paul believes. He is saying, stating a false thing and then refuting it. Um, so uh, verse 12 begins with a quote from the Corinthians, and I will you know, help you see um, back and forth uh, what is the Corinthians and what is Paul. So first the Corinthians, verse 12. All things are lawful for me. That's the Corinthians. That's their slogan that they're quoting. But not all things are helpful. That's Paul. All things are lawful for me, Corinthians again, but I will not be dominated by anything. That's Paul. Food is meant for the stomach, and stomach for the food, and God will destroy both one and the other. That's the Corinthians. I think the whole thing there is Corinthians. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. That's Paul, and so is all the rest. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against or you could translate that, with reference to his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now, I think that there's three important things here that will help enable us to speak effectively to somebody like Joe. First, we see an explanation of the Corinthian error. And then we can see how that error is something we can all too easily fall into. Second, Paul's argument against that error. And finally, an exhortation about how we should live. First, what is the error? What did they get wrong? Their error is twofold. 
It concerns how they lived and what they believed. And that ought not to surprise us, right? Uh, there is always a relationship between belief and practice. That's why we watch our life and our doctrine, right? You have to do both. Now, their life was immoral. They lived in a way that was immoral, sexual immorality. Their lifestyle comes through in that first quote. All things are lawful for me, right? You understand what that means. I can do whatever I want. I can sleep with whomever I want. I can, I can do what I want with my body. There's no constraints. All things are lawful. That was their lifestyle, one of unbridled lust. We see the error in their belief in the second slogan, which is how they justify their lifestyle. Food is for the stomach, and stomach for the food, and God will destroy both. Now, at first, they're like, wait, that makes no sense. <laughs> but you have to realize that when the Corinthians said this, they weren't talking about food. They were talking about sex. But they were relating it to food. Here is their logic. Our bodies are, in some sense, for food, right? We know that because we get hungry. <laughs> and we satisfy the desire for food by eating. And anything that satisfies my desire for eating is really legitimate for me to eat, right? There's no moral significance attached to the food that I eat, right? And this is built on the fact that for Christians, all food is clean, right? We don't have to observe dietary restrictions for moral reasons. <laughs> you might observe them for physical reasons, but not for moral reasons, right? The Corinthians believed that they could think the same thing about sex. Our bodies want it, so anything that satisfies the desire for it must be good for our bodies, must be okay, must be legitimate. To think this way is to cut off the body from any moral structure and to deal with the body simply as a physical thing, to deal with the body simply biologically. And because the body is cut off from a moral structure, the desires for the body itself become the, the authority for what is good or not good for the body. And part of their logic is also the fact that sex and the body will be destroyed, and God will destroy both one and the other. This was the philosophy of Gnosticism which was all over the place in the, the ancient world, and which said that the material world, the physical world, the physicality of this world is not significant. And anything having to do with the physical world is just not important. It's not that the Corinthians did not believe there was morality, they did. <laughs> they thought Paul was a bad apostle, right? There, there's a morality there. It's just that they didn't believe it pertained to the body. Sanctification was something outside the body. So the Corinthians had an error in their thinking. Right, the body was made for sex, sex for the body, and the body would be destroyed. And this led to an error in their living, sexual immorality. And actually, both fueled one and the other. Friends, this should caution us. Are we thinking about the body in a, in a Christian way? Are we separating the body from morality? The body is very, very important in the Bible, and especially in Paul's uh, letters. It's interesting, uh, Romans 12, right? That great exhortation to renew our minds is followed by the exhortation to present our bodies. The theology of the body is very important for our theology of sanctification because if we don't have a theology of the body, what are then we presenting to God? How do we present our bodies to God if we don't know biblically what the body is? It is all too easy to fall in this error of living if we don't think rightly about the body. So the, the subtext for this message is, do you have a biblical theology of the body, a theology of the body that's biblical. Okay, that's their error. Now, what is Paul's argument against the error? This is the second point. Paul's argument kind of goes in circles here. He covers the same ground uh, at least three times, and each time it's like he builds momentum. <laughs> each time it's like he gets stronger and stronger until he gets to that exhortation at the end, glorify God in your bodies. 
Paul summarizes the argument the first time around in the second part of verse 13 and verse 14 when he says the body is not meant for sexual morality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. In other words, it's as, it's as if, Paul's brilliant, right? It's as if Paul is saying, okay, Corinthians, I will accept the premise that what the body is for and what the body will be informs our sexual ethic. Remember, they believe the body was for sex and the body would be destroyed. But he, he, he tells them they're wrong in their thinking. The body was not made for sexual morality, for, for strictly the biological desire. The body was made for the Lord. And the body will not be destroyed. The body will be raised. So you're dead wrong on both of your assumptions. And, and if we adjust that, if we say, no, the body's not made for, for its biological pleasure, the body will not be destroyed, it's made for the Lord, it will be raised, we get a whole different sexual ethic. A whole, it leads us in a completely different direction, namely, glorify God in your body. Now, reflecting on these verses, it's important to notice what Paul does not say. What we might expect him to say. And what a lot of Christian ethics proceeds along the lines as if he said, which is, the body was not made for immorality, but for holiness. And then he goes on to give them a list of things that they do in order to be holy. That's not what he does here. I listened to one sermon on this passage that was, was a, a good sermon in many ways, pointed out some helpful things, but it, it framed this whole passage by saying, here are the biblical guidelines of how to use our sexuality. I don't see Paul doing that here. He, he's not giving us rules. He, he's not saying, here's how you do it. He, his ethic is far more relational. Right? It's true, think of it this way, it's true that the body was not made for holy, the body was made for holiness, and it's true that there are rules that we have to follow. Right? All things are lawful for me is wrong. But notice, Paul does not respond to that by telling them, okay, this is lawful, this is not. This is lawful, this is He doesn't go there. That's not how this passage works. Instead, and if you don't get anything else, at least get this, Paul's ethic is relational at its core. We are made for the Lord. That's what Paul says here, right? It's our union with the Lord, our union with Christ, that governs our sexual ethic, not what is lawful and what is not. Although there are things that are lawful and what they're not. It's not that those rules aren't there, it's just that that's not the core that governs our sexual ethic. Living a moral life is not simply about following the rules, although we do that too, but about participating in the life of a person, about belonging to a person, about orienting our lives for this person namely the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the true husband of the church. The true atrocity of our sin is not that we fall short of a standard or that we fail to be the full witnesses of Christ that we would like to be, although both of those are true too. The true atrocity of our sin is that we are people made for him, united to him, belonging to him, and will one day be raised with him and then we give ourselves to things that are a contradiction of him. We, we give ourselves to things that oppose him and he opposes. Now, I think it's important as we start framing the, the sexual ethic in this, with this relational core that we pay specific attention to how Paul speaks of the body in this regard. Because often when we start thinking about, oh, our union with Christ, we're, we're made for Christ, our oneness with Christ, we start moving away from anything that has to do with the body. We think, well, that's, that's the spiritual reality. It's not a bodily reality. Well, Paul would say, no, it, it is a bodily reality, actually. <laughs> we are, um, Paul says here, the body is for Christ. The body is for Christ, and Christ is for the body. Right? This mutual coming together. And the body will be raised. And, and notice, before he says the body will be raised, he says God raised Christ and God will raise us. So, so there's a union with Christ in the resurrection. 
So our union with Christ is a bodily reality now and especially in the life to come. One day we will understand that the body is implicated in our union with Christ and our oneness with Christ in, in, a, in a very deep and comprehensive way. And therefore we cannot separate morality from the body. We cannot look at the body as if it is just a body, as if it is just a biological thing. We must let our union with Christ, our oneness with Christ, and the, the present bodily and especially the future bodily reality of that union govern the way we see the body now. We must look at our body in light of our future bodies, our future bodies in union with Christ, and then look back at the body now. That's exactly what Paul is doing, right? He's confronting the Corinthian heir with an eschatology of the body in union with Christ. Now, after introducing his thesis, Paul then forces the Corinthians to take a long, hard look at the meaning of their sexual sin. And this is kind of dark and gruesome, I have to warn you. I think there was one point where I thought I was going to change this, this text. I didn't want to preach on this text. And, and then as I thought about why don't I want to preach on this text, it was because I didn't really want to deal with this stuff here, because it's, it's, it's dark and it is gruesome. Um, Paul begins, verse 15, with a seemingly innocent question. I think of the Corinthians, they must have read that question in verse 15, be like, oh, there's nothing. You know, they didn't see what was coming. <laughs> but 15 begins with a seemingly innocent question. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Our bodies are members of Christ. Not just the soul is united to Christ. The body is united to Christ. Our bodies are united to Christ. Let's just think about that theologically a little bit. Paul has just said that the body will be raised. And the only reason that the body will be raised is because the bodies are already united to Christ. Listen to what the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, question 37, says in this regard. The question, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? Answer. The souls of believers are at death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory. And, listen to this, their bodies, being still united to Christ, do rest in their graves till the resurrection. The bodies of believers that have gone to be with the Lord are still, their bodies in the grave are still united to Christ. There would be no hope of the resurrection otherwise, unless our bodies, dead and living, are united to Christ. This is why the, the Son of God had to become incarnate. It's rightly said that what the Son of God did not assume, he did not heal. What he did not assume, he did not heal. He assumed a human body so he could heal the human body. And the only way he heals anything is by uniting that to himself. For this reason, Jesus had to become human and then unite his body to our bodies so that in his resurrection, we would also be raised. There is no hope of the resurrection unless our bodies are united to Christ. We see a similar thing about the body in what Jesus said to Paul on that Damascus road. Remember, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul was dumbfounded. Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, uh, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Paul was persecuting Christ because he was persecuting the bodies of those who were united to Christ. Or actually, we should say, who are united to Christ, right? They still are. And then, after this seemingly innocent question, Paul says, asks a very provocative question. Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Or a slightly better way to translate that might be, shall I take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Should I rip out a piece of Christ and attach it to a prostitute, something that contradicts Christ? Paul is saying, this is what your sexual immorality is. Do you really want to do that? Oh, people who think all things are lawful for me. Is that really lawful? 
Is it really lawful to rip out Christ and stick it to a prostitute? Now, as if the reasons why we should not do that are not painfully obvious to us already, Paul then goes on to explain. He explains that when you engage in relations with a prostitute, you become one with her. Your body is united to hers. There's a union involved. And he quotes Genesis 2, as you see there. I don't think he means to say you're now married to the prostitute. Sex is the sign and seal of the covenant of marriage, but it doesn't automatically equate to marriage. And yet, even when it's practiced outside of marriage, there's still a union, right? It's like glue that brings two people together. The Corinthians can talk all they want about how what they do in their body doesn't matter, that it's not a moral category, that it's just like food. But that's like pretending gravity doesn't exist and then jumping off of a tall building. You're still going to get hurt. They can say that what they do in their body doesn't matter, but of course there were women crying late at night when their husbands were going down to the temple prostitute. There were children who, who were discarded or grew up without loving parents. There were men who were abused for as long as they can remember because, yes, some of these prostitutes were young boys. Prostitutes, in quotes. Now, all of these painful realities do indeed occur when we separate sex from marriage. But the primary motivation, notice, the primary motivation for not committing sexual immorality is that you are one with Christ. And so becoming one with a prostitute is a contradiction of who you are and a contradiction of who Christ is because you are joined to him. And nothing you do is separated from him. And we should note here that Paul is using the me metaphor of marriage to explain the relationship we have with Christ, which is what makes sexual sin so utterly wrong and inconsistent for us. He says the one who is joined to Christ is one spirit with him. And that word joined is the same word uh, in, the, in the Greek Bible in, in Genesis where it talks about the man will cleave to his wife. We, we are in a marriage type relationship with Christ. And therefore it is impossible that we should join ourselves to something that contradicts him because of the relationship which we have with him. Once again, the, the marriage metaphor is a motivator for holiness. The marriage metaphor explains for us the meaning of our bodies and the meaning of our sexual sin. Sexual immorality contradicts our marriage vows. And it contradicts our union with Christ. Contradicting our marriage vows might seem like the most obvious problem with it, right? That's the thing that, that causes the consternation and difficulties and pain in the church and families. But it's the contradiction of our union with Christ that is the more severe thing. And if we're going to start confronting it, if we're going to speak to somebody like Joe, you start there. You start with the contradiction of our union with Christ. It's worth reflecting a bit when we're understanding this marriage metaphor to, to th think on why Paul says we are one spirit with Christ instead of saying we are one body with Christ. It might seem that this would weaken Paul's point, right? Because if we're one spirit with Christ, well, maybe what we do in the body doesn't matter after all. Maybe that spiritual union with Christ leaves us free to do what we want in the body. Is that what it means? Absolutely not. I think Paul would actually affirm that we are one body with Christ. He's just said that our, our bodies are members of Christ. And in Ephesians, Paul quotes the the one flesh union, and says it refers to Christ in the church. Of course, the, the one body with Christ is not in any kind of sexual way, but there is a union of the body involved. He doesn't say one spirit with Christ in order to get away from the bodily reality. Rather, he says one spirit with Christ to point to an even stronger union with Christ that we have than the union of the body. You see, in the Bible, um, in the Bible, the, 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 conf, the um, dichotomy between the spirit and the body is not one of materiality versus immateriality. 
It's one of weakness and strength. And, and Paul even says in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians that we will be raised and have a spiritual body, which doesn't mean a non-physical body because that would be a contradiction of terms, right? It means a body that is so infused by the Spirit that it is strong, it is life, it will never die. A union with Christ that was merely of the body would ultimately have a weakness built into it. Think of marriage. Till death do us part. It ends because of the weakness of the body. But a union of the Spirit is a bond that will never break. It will never end. Nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. Speaking of the Spirit, Paul goes on to say, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit whom you have in you? This is another perspective on why sexual sin is so wrong. It's inconsistent with who we are. We are temples for the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit. Notice he doesn't say, your bodies will be a temple for the Holy Spirit if you can clean up your act and, and you know, live rightly. We are temple for the Holy Spirit. We are holy. In the verse just before this section, in, in verse 11 of chapter 6, Paul said, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is who we are. This is called definitive sanctification. We are holy. And Paul's point is that the body itself is holy, categorically holy, because it's a temple for the Lord, and the temple is a holy place. And so we dare not take what is holy and unite it with what is unholy, with what is unclean, for that would implicate Christ in the uncleanness. Now, Paul doesn't really mean that we can make Christ unclean, but he's saying this is what you're trying to do. This is the, the intention of your actions. This is what it's headed towards. Do you really want to do that? Understanding all of this heightens the severity of all sin, but especially sexual sin. Look there at verse 18. Every other sin is committed outside the body, but sexual immorality is sin against the body, or you could translate that with reference to the body. This doesn't mean that sexual sin is worse than all other sins. But it does mean that sexual sin implicates the body in a way that all other sin does not. Sexual sin is more holistic. It's like Paul is saying to the Corinthians, your thinking is exactly the opposite of what it should be. You're thinking that because what you do sexually is something in the body, therefore it doesn't matter. Paul says, no, precisely because it is in the body is why it matters so much. If I fall prey into a, if I fall into a pattern of, of prideful thinking, you know, I can alter that e more easily because it is something of the mind. It's hard to change a pattern of lust and especially physical actions because they trigger responses in my body that my body comes to expect. Sexual sin can, become, can be more addictive than other sins because it alters the body. It is sin with reference to the body. The body that is a member of Christ. The body that is one spirit with Christ and a temple for the Holy Spirit. Oh, we dare not engage in sexual sin. Finally, we see the exhortation that Paul gives. And pastors, if you want to speak into the life of somebody like Joe, you can't just give them right arguments. You've got to do what the Bible does, which is exhort. And your exhortation must be meaningful. It can't be empty platitudes. It must have content to it, gospel-driven content. And this is exactly what we see Paul doing here. Look there at verse 20. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Notice a couple things right off. 
Notice how the glorification of God that Paul has in mind here is with reference to the body. The whole, all the theology in this section has been orienting us to the body. We glorify God then within our bodies. Again, underscoring the, the reason why it is so critical that we have a right theology of the body. Otherwise, how will you know how to glorify God in your body if you don't think rightly about the body? Notice also how this exhortation flows out of who we are, our identity. A similar theme that we saw in Romans 7. According to this passage, according to verse 20, who are we? We are not our own. We have no authority to understand the body from the body then if, if we, including our bodies, are not our own. If we want to understand the body and really our whole person, we must start with whose bodies we are. <laughs> we must start with the fact that our bodies belong to God because he has purchased them, right? You, you've been bought with a price. You've been purchased. You belong to God. We are people who belong to the Lord, bodies included. I don't think anyone explains the implications of this better than John Calvin. Let me read something that he said regarding uh, who we are. He writes this in the Institutes. We are not our own. Let not our reason nor our will therefore sway our plans and deeds. Notice he begins with our identity. We are not our own. Let us therefore not set it as our goal to seek what is expedient for us according to the flesh. We are not our own. Insofar as we can, let us forget ourselves and all that is ours. Conversely, we are God's. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We are God's. Let his wisdom and will therefore rule all our actions. We are God's. Let all the parts of our life accordingly strive towards him as the only lawful goal. And that lawful goal is to glorify God in our bodies. How do we glorify God in our bodies? That's not so easy to answer. I can, know, I can say that because I've written this next part of the sermon about five times and I'm still not quite happy with it. But I pray that it might spur you on to thinking something that will be more helpful than what I say here. It's difficult to understand what it means to glorify God in our bodies because we have to reckon with the fact that this is a positive command. He's telling us not to simply don't do this, do this. And therefore, we can't think that we've obeyed the command, the positive command, simply because we haven't done that. Right? It's like the, the, the command Paul gives, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor with his own hands so that he may have something to give to those in need. He's not being godly if he just doesn't steal. You've got to do the positive part of it, too. What's the positive part related to our, our sexuality here? We can't think we've done it just because we've not committed sexual morality. How do we glorify God with our bodies? Or to put it another way, when Paul, Paul tells us here to flee sexual morality, we should do that. But where do we go when we flee? Well, we run towards God. But we must run towards God in such a way that we are now glorifying God in our bodies. What does that look like? Well, let me suggest a couple of things, tentatively, okay? We glorify God in our bodies by waiting for the redemption of our bodies. In chapter 8 of Romans, Paul says that we anxiously wait for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. We, we anxiously wait for the redemption of our bodies. The redemption of our bodies is another way talking, of talking about that full consummation of our union with Christ that will implicate the body, that will involve the body. So what do we do now to glorify God in our bodies? We wait for the redemption of our bodies. Like, well, that's not actually something we do. Yes, it is. Waiting is active. Waiting is not forgetting. <laughs> Waiting is anticipating, is longing, is structuring our lives according to that future reality, even though it hasn't yet happened, even though we don't yet have it. 
we glorify God in our bodies by waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Or, or to use the marriage, the marriage metaphor, maybe we could say this. Think of an engaged couple anxiously waiting to be married, right? They're not yet, they have good pastoral care and godly, if they're, they're not yet doing anything with their bodies together, right? They're engaged. They're anxiously waiting for marriage, though, right? And as they get closer to that day, they become more and more cognizant of the fact that their bodies will be given to another, right? Their bodies that they have kept hidden in private for all their lives will now be given to another. And as they anxiously wait for that day, they begin to see their bodies differently. They begin to see their bodies as being for another. They might look at themselves in the mirror and see themselves differently, knowing that their bodies will be given to another that there will be a certain sense, which Paul explains also in this book, that they are handing over the authority of their bodies to somebody else. My body will be given to this person whom I love so that I can know them in my body and they can know me. Likewise, I suggest that if we are to anxiously wait for the full redemption of our bodies, that full consummation of a relationship with Christ, which is something that implicates the body, we would begin to see our body differently we would be conscious of the fact that our bodies are not our own, that they will be presented to Christ. He will glorify our bodies with His glory. Our bodies will be the means by which we know Him, a means by which we know Him. Of course, not in a sexual way at all, but in a way that our sexuality points to. That's how we will know Christ, in our bodies. And as we long for that glorification of our bodies with Christ, we become more aware of how inconsistent it is to do anything in our bodies that will contradict that future reality. But not only that, not only do we turn from that, but we turn to an orientation of our body that is preparing for that future glory. And I think as we long for the redemption of our bodies, we become conscious of how God has given us our bodies to serve the body, right? We have hands to serve those in the church. We have mouths to speak encouraging words. We have ears to listen to their concerns. Even our physical presence of the body matters. I'm very aware of that right now as I'm away from my family. I've been for a week and will be for another week. And, and I'm talking to them on the phone and, yet, and seeing them even on WhatsApp. And yet there's a sense where that's not enough. I want to actually be there with them even if we'd have the same sort of conversation. Bodily presence matters. And one way you glorify God with your body is gathering as one body in the church. But what about how we glorify God with our bodies in our sexuality? That's the theme of this section. By the way, the further I go in this application section, the more and more tentative my, uh, <laughs> my thoughts are here. But anyway, I'll, I'll pass them out, out, out to you anyway. How do we glorify God positively with our body? Not just negatively by not doing things. Positively with our body. What does that look like? Let me suggest a couple things. I think we can begin to understand how we do that by thinking about how our sexuality now points to the consummation of our union with Christ to come. And then looking backwards from that perspective of the consummation at our sexuality now. And then orienting it towards the future to come. That future glory is not sexual, of course, but it's not asexual either. It's what our sexuality points to. It's beyond sexual, right? Gender will still be there. There's a reason why it's a marriage between... <laughs> Christ as the groom and the church as the bride. Just as we look at the body now in light of what it will be when it is raised, so also we can look at our sexuality now in light of what it will be when it is in some sense raised. Now I think part of what that means is obviously not uniting with somebody other than your spouse because the exclusivity of that future church Christ's relationship is, is, is significant in terms of what that relationship is, right? 
There is no savior husband other than him. The church devotes herself entirely to him. There ought then to be exclusivity in our sexual relationship here on earth. And that, of course, means that we do not go to the prostitute, to, to somebody else, negatively. But it also means, I think, orienting ourselves so that that exclusivity becomes a goal, not simply in a strictly have I violated this r r rule sense, but in terms of what we're oriented towards, praying that God would give you a desire for your spouse alone, that you wouldn't even want to be attracted to anybody else. There's more than just that. What is the meaning of our final union with Christ on that final day? It means that we know him. It means that we commune with him in an intimate way. It means that he reveals himself to us, right? John tells us that we will see him as he is. Jesus prays, I want them to be with me to see my glory. It is an act of revelation where we know him. And if that's what the final reality that our sexuality points to, then we should discipline ourselves to think of it now as an act of knowing, an act of relationship, an act of belonging. We ought not to think of it in another way. It does more than just that, right? Our sexuality now guards us from temptations. It's a means by which we have children. And yet, in, in and through all that, if we take what it is on that final day and then bring it back now, it's an act of knowing. It's not just a euphemism in the Old Testament that Adam was knowing his wife, right? That's because that's what the act is. And so we should discipline our lives to, to think of it in that way and practice it in that way. And in so doing, we are glorifying God in our bodies because we're anticipating what that final glorification will be. We ought not to hold it idolatrously either. We ought not to get so wrapped up in the union with our spouse that we forget that it is only a picture of the ultimate reality. We don't want to think of it as our salvation. It is only a picture of what is to come. There's far more that could be said here. My point is not to say everything that needs to be said pastorally to a, a married couple. My point is to just get us thinking that there's a way we could positively understand that command to glorify God in our bodies as it relates to our sexuality. If you want to think more about this, I'd encourage you to look at Song of Solomon and notice how the lovers talk about each other's bodies, how they implicate the whole person in the way that they talk to each other and about each other. For instance, their favorite part of the body to talk about is the eyes. Think about that. When you look into somebody's eyes, you see them looking back at you, underscoring the interpersonal communication. The second favorite part of the body to talk about in Song of Solomon is the mouth. Yes, because they enjoy kissing, but also because they speak to one another. Their words are meaningful because in everything they're doing together, they are communicating. They are knowing one another. What about singles? How will this glorifying God in their body. How can singles be positively oriented in this way? Well, I, I'm struck by something that Oliver O'Donovan said. He said that both singleness and marriage points to the future glory. Marriage, by looking back to the beginning and then to the future glory. Singleness, by looking directly to that future glory. And the closer we get to that future glory, the more singleness is valued. That's why there's really no category for singleness in the Old Testament, but there is in the New. Glorifying God with your body as a single means being conscious of the fact that though your body could be united with another body here on earth, if it's not, the ultimate meaning of who you are and the ultimate meaning of your sexuality will not be in the least unfulfilled because it points to that future glory. Well, we must conclude. There are people like Joe in your church. And perhaps you who are listening to this are Joe. Perhaps you are struggling with these things now. 
of all the sins that we could struggle with, I think this is the one that we're most likely to just throw rules at, right? You're struggling with this? Okay, here, do this, do this, do this. And of all the sins that we could struggle with, this is the one where rules have the least ability to actually inflict much change. There is indeed another way, a way that begins with the gospel, with our union with Christ. And you know, the interesting thing about this sin, even though it can be one of the hardest things to struggle against, as we struggle against it with the gospel, it can open up new vistas of understanding of our relationship with Christ. Some people who struggle through sexual sin for years would say, well, of course they wouldn't wish any of the harm that has been inflicted upon their family or friends because of it. They can say, thank you, God, for this struggle, because in and through this struggle, I learned what it means to be united to Christ. We serve a Savior. We have a Savior. We're united to this Savior who can use even our darkest and most insidious sins for his glory. So let's cling to him. Amen. Thank you.